information, news, and entertainment on demand. WSRadio.com <laughs> Welcome to the Changing Stage, music gear talk from the manufacturers and musicians who define the biz. Here's your host, Florentino Buenaventura. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Everybody want some sound advice today in the music business? Yeah, yeah, it's- it's awesome. We're all here because we're all in the music business. I, I assume more people who are interested in the music business. Uh, my name is Florentino Buena Ventura. I know that's kind of long, but uh, that's the name my family gave me. I am the uh, CEO of Intertalk Radio. It's a network all about the business for you folks, by folks in the business. A lot of notables like J.R. Robinson, the most recorded drummer in history. Of course, we have our, our show that's been killing it. Jackie Bertoni of Jackie's Groove is uh, a show, again, all about the business. And they talk to notables in the business. We just had Liberty DeVito, the drummer for Billy Joel, on this week. Uh, for the engineers in the, uh, in the room, Bruce Swedian. I can hardly pronounce that right. I can never say his last name. Uh, so, so Dean, there we go. There we go. There's somebody who knows that. So he's an amazing engineer that's been doing it since the days of Count Basie. And uh, uh, we've, uh, we've got schedule coming up. Uh, uh, we've got uh, a number of different great folks. Uh, so, you know, we're here to be a voice for you asking questions. Of course, we'll have a chance for you guys to also ask your questions at the end of this uh, panel. And, uh, you know, I would like to pass it to Barbara here, who, who is the organizer and getting this going on. So Barbara, take it away. Hi, so my name is Barbara Leung. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm part of Make Music LA, uh, who is responsible for putting this panel together. Um, it is a yearly celebration on June 21st, uh, where a lot of different cities around the world celebrate music. And I'm going to have the president of Make Music LA come up and talk about uh, Make Music LA, uh, Dorsey de June. <laughs> Over here, right here. This microphone in this spot right here would be a So everyone one. can see you. Oh, by the way, we're all on air right now. So we're going live on air as well as we're being filmed. So you all are going to be stars. 50 minutes of fun. Hi, good evening. I'm Dorsey Dujan, and I'm actually founder of Make Music LA. The president of Make Music LA is Leroy Downs, and he's sitting right back there. I'd like to... Thank Barbara for putting this together and to the Musicians Institute for hosting and for all the panelists and for our co-sponsors. This is really quite wonderful for us because we love musicians and we love to hear you play. To tell you a little bit about Make Music LA, um, it actually is a, a festival that started in France over 35 years ago and it is the Fête de la Musique. And what that means is make music. And in France, it is now a national holiday, and everyone comes out into the streets, the parks, the plazas, and they play. If you Google Fête de la Musique and you look at the photographs of Paris, it's extraordinary. And what we'd like to do here is to bring that same flavor of bringing the music out into the streets. And we've done it. We're in our fifth year now. And we absolutely need all of you to be receptive and want to participate in this for a couple of reasons. One is that this is the fourth largest economy in California, is the entertainment industry, of which you are a part of. We also need to have our kids educated, and a music education is something that I think all of you really recognize how transformative it is for your lives. And we'd like to see more of that happen since so many schools have cut out music programs. And one way that we can help to do that is by bringing it to everyone. You know, you can, we can't really wait for someone else to do it. We really have to take an active role in, in being a part of the process for change. So 
what we do is we have on our website uh, matchmaking software that introduces artists to venues and venues to artists. Everything is free, and the concerts are free for that day only. We do recognize the importance of musicians, and we want you to be paid for what you do. However, if you are able to give back in your communities and to communities that are underserved on that day, it's really very special and something that a lot of people are very grateful for, that sound of music and the joy that it brings to them. So we would love you to participate in Make Music LA. Uh, if you want to or tell people about it, we would be really very happy. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dorsey. And um, one, other, uh, one of the reasons that this panel came together is actually from a conversation that um, Casey Spilkis Dunmore over there on the, on the right uh, and I talked about. Um, we've been in the music business for a little bit of time, and we, are, we keep talking about what are the things that we, what we wanted to hear when we started out? What are the things that are, are, are constructive? And we didn't learn it all in the classroom. And so I brought together some of my favorite people in the music industry who come from all different walks uh, to give us different perspectives on their journey and their experience. Um, that um, we had to be very creative in the way that we approached um, our careers as well as our creations, our music. Um, so I'm going to go down the line, and each panelist is going to have the chance to share their experiences. Um, and we'll start with Andrea Magdalena. Um, I Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I was like, I met Andrea Magdalena through her nonprofit, She Said So. And she has been very instrumental in bringing about um, empowerment in women in the music industry. And I'm going to have her talk a little bit about that. Hi again. I am so grateful for you and to you, Barbie, particularly for putting me on this panel. I was, I was telling her earlier, I, I feel a bit like, a, like the black sheep of the group because I am not a musician myself, uh, although I wish I was. And um, I, I am truly humbled to, to join this lovely panel today. Um, to tell you a bit about She Said So, it's a network, a global network of women who work in the music industry, not so much geared towards talent, towards the musician, but more for women like myself behind the scenes, um, with the aim of ultimately empowering talent, obviously. We felt like there aren't enough women um, involved in various verticals within the industry, particularly in senior roles at an executive level. And so that's why she said so was born, to empower each other, to connect with each other, to create events like this one today um, and, and create more role models that other younger generations can draw inspiration from. I'm originally from Romania, but lived in, in London for a few years. That's where I went to school. And uh, that's where she said so was born. So since its inception in September 2014, we've been running monthly events in London since October 2015 oh, uh, in LA as well. So if you are interested in attending any of these, um, check out our website for more info. And the plan is to expand our network of partnerships. We've worked with Amsterdam Dance Event, which is Europe's largest um, in the industry focused uh, conference slash festivals for electronic music. We've worked with, AD, with South by Southwest, with M4 Montreal, and various other conferences and festivals along these lines. Um, so yeah, that's, that's us. Awesome. Oh, there we go. Awesome, Andrea. I'm excited about uh, learning more about your network. Next to you is a good friend of mine. Uh, he has been a songwriter for... I always get this wrong, man. Okay, let me see if I can get it right. I'm terrible with names, by the way. Uh, beautiful Young in a Hurry. Oh, my God. Florentino. Did I nail it? Almost. You had all young, the right words, just in the wrong order. Young, beautiful in a hurry. There you Here go. go. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why be in a hurry? That's how I should remember yeah, that. Yes, YBH. Why be in a hurry? Uh, Brendan McCurry is a songwriter, he is a uh, singer, he is a, the total artist package. 
and he has really uh, been an inspiration for me and a lot of the people at the network. Uh, he has also been a, uh, you know, he, he writes music, for, well, written music for Battlestar Galactica, for Defiance, and he is the lead singer for Oingo Boingo's Dance Party, which pretty much is Oingo Boingo uh, emerged with all of, most of the members and Brendan as the lead singer. And, uh, that's, that's true. So t- take it away, sir. Okay, so yes, my name is Very Brendan good. McCreary. Um, hello. Stop it. Stop. Um, yes, I am a songwriter, producer, performer, vocalist, musician. Um, recently, I was the resident songwriter on a little TV show called Defiance on Sci Fi Network. Uh, what else do I do? I'm the lead singer for Oingo Boingo Dance Party. I'm the lead singer for a band called Young Beautiful in a Hurry. <laughs> And that's, that's pretty much most of it. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Barbara will yell at me after we're done. Uh, that's, yeah, that's what I do. All right. We, we have a little video reel of um, some of his work, so we'll show that. I also forgot to mention that uh, I started a production company called Remix Noise with Barbara over here, remixnoise.com. So that was the other thing I forgot. Got it in there now. My channel is the best Freddie Mercury I've ever heard. <laughs> All right. And, and beside Brendan is Miriam Cutler. And Miriam 
is just uh, someone who I admire so much. Uh, she's been very instrumental in breaking through to the documentary world. She has over 100 plus film and TV credits, and she's also the co-founder of a wonderful organization called the Alliance for Women Film Composers. And um, I'll have her talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> well, since this is about uh, unusual ways of getting a career, <laughs> um, I, I always like to point out to people, my career really took a really just like a windy road. And I think that the main thing I've learned is that you have to follow your heart, but use your head to figure out how to make it work. Um, I was in college going for a master's degree in anthropology, and I left school to become an activist while I was performing in bands on the side. I didn't really take it very seriously. I've always had a real desire to, you know, try to make the world a little bit better. So I was in these fringy type bands, and <laughs> one of them was the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. And we used to do street theater and wear gorilla suits and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was so much fun. Um, so I was doing all of that, and um, finally I decided, it was really because of being in the Oingo Boingo with such great musicians, I decided to try to be a musician full time. So I was a songwriter. I mean, I basically, my career kind of followed all the big uh, changes that have happened in the music industry. You know, when I first started out, we were still doing analog. Nobody had home studios. It was really considered, you know, very... Um, you know, unprofessional to try to record at home unless you had a major professional studio. And so all my, you know, I started seeing, you know, as I, I was a songwriter and I decided to make a little songwriting demo studio so that I wouldn't have to spend a fortune every time I had an idea. And also very shortly after that, um, computers came into existence in music. I mean, we were doing everything with no synchronization and no computers, basically, in the 70s and 80s. I was one of the first people I knew. My friends thought I was crazy because I started having a studio at home and I started with a little Fostex four-track cassette and I got such... <laughs> I mean, I did full-blown demos on that thing, you know, with horn section, drums, singers, backup singers. It was really, you know... <laughs> and I was a person who couldn't even plug in a stereo, okay? So that just shows you when you have a strong desire you can overcome almost anything, because I'm about as untechnical. When I first started, I was very untechnical. I was basically a street musician. Um, so as the technology evolved, eventually when the computers came in, all of a sudden I realized, I, I had never thought of being a film composer. I was a songwriter and a performer. And um, when the computers came in, all of a sudden, the first, time, the first thing I had... You know, first you had an FSK tone generator, which allowed you to drive from a video player to get a tape deck to, to follow it. And then um, I had a Roland bass sequencer with one track. Um, then a friend of mine turned me on to his Commodore computer, and there was eight tracks. And I was like, yes! <laughs> and, you know, Korg was coming out with these synths and Juno 106 and... You know, this is the stuff we we just thought it was amazing, and everybody sort of went through this passionate love affair with these synthesizers and started not using strings and real instruments. And if you listen to movies that came out during that period, <laughs> they are really cheesy. Uh, you know, it did it, after a while things settled down, but for so during that period, also let's see. So then Mac came out with the Mac Classic, and that was like okay. I think we had 32 tracks and performer came into being. There were maybe two or three other other uh, systems, but I stuck with digital, I stuck with Performer, and all this gray hair is really, <laughs> you know. Yeah, Performer will, if you're not a man, it'll make you one. <laughs> um, but uh, it's finally settled down. It's pretty damn good now as far as being a tool for composers. Um, at any rate, you know, I remember when I used to hear about the ability to really synchronize to picture but Fostex in the 80s came out with a semi-professional system, and they had uh, an 8-track and a 16-track. <laughs> and um, let's see, where they had an 8-track and a 16-track, and I eventually ended up with a system that had a 30-ips 16-track, a 2-track mastering machine, and it was all synchronized to the video by um, 
this wonderful $1,600 synchronizing unit, which was, you know, before that you had to drop four grand or something to have synchronization. So then I was really on my way. I, I actually, um, a friend of mine was working for a low-budget horror movie company, and he, he said, hey, you want to score a movie? And I was like, yeah. So I, I spent the next few years working for that company. I must have done about 10 or 15 really, really bad horror, horror movies. And um, at the same time, in those days, I'd say the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of corporate work in L.A. You could really, I mean, that's what I mean. The industry just keeps changing, you know, like one of the ways I was able to support myself and, oh, oh by, before that, I was actually in a band and I made my living playing in a band because in those days, you know, we had a gig four nights a week in a club and you could actually support yourself doing that and some weddings. And... Um, and eventually, you know, I mean, see, some of these jobs have just disappeared. But, but there's new things that always replace it. So then what came into being to replace that was that if you were a good musician and had some recording gear, you could actually produce these the music for these corporate videos. And it became a way that you could really support yourself while you were trying to get into more creative work. I mean, they were actually fun to do because, you know, a lot of action music for cars and Toyota, you know, and Nissan and all these different things. And... So I did that for a number of years, and I was actually solvent. After about 10 years in doing this, I was solvent and making a living, and I wanted to slip my wrists. Um, so I decided, if there's nothing more about this, you know, I can't keep doing horrible movies. I just couldn't seem to make any progress. And um, I was about to give up and go back to, I don't know, maybe law school or something. <laughs> and, um, and then I met this documentary film composer. He told me about his film that he was going to make and he didn't have much money but I really it resonated for me and I felt you know drawn back into my roots of, of you know social action it was a film called License to Kill and it was about he went into prisons to interview men who had murdered gay men and ask them why they thought that was okay it was very simple but very very powerful so I scored the film and then we got into Sundance in 1997 and so I went to Sundance, and the film won two awards, and I met, all of a sudden I met this documentary community. And I saw all these people who shared my values, but also wanted to make really wonderful films. So I was just completely set on fire, and I made it my business to pursue that community and become part of it. And that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. I've been extremely happy working in that genre. Um, and all the films are different, you know. Some films are social justice. Some films are, are like biographies and, you know, character studies. They're always different. The filmmakers are always different. Um, and over the years, the actual craft of, of the documentary filmmaking has expanded to include so much more use of music and all kinds of music. In the beginning, they were really afraid of music, but now they really embrace it. So it's been really fun for me to... Um, kind of grow with the genre and and just make my life in that way. So I think that about covers my life story. I left out some of the sleazy parts. Awesome. Miriam, would you like me to show a clip of one of the documentaries that you scored? I, I guess. Um, Ethel, I suppose. Uh, this is a film. Um, one of the filmmakers I've worked with a lot is Rory Kennedy, who is the daughter of Bobby Kennedy and Ethel Kennedy. And at a certain point, I had done a bunch of films with her, and one day she called me up and she said, Miriam, we're going to make a film about my mother. And I said, oh, is it going to be a personal doc? And she said, oh, no. <laughs> um, HBO wanted a, a documentary about her mother, so um, she decided that she would do it. And it started out as a short. We were into, in, you know, well into production, and then they loved it so much they decided to make it into a feature film. This is the open.
peace of God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We remember the birth of Robert Francis Kennedy and his rebirth into the new life of the kingdom. I was reading the beautiful statement on the monument here. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. My father, Robert F. Kennedy, died on June 6, 1968, more than 40 years ago. I'm Rory, his last and 11th child. Because I was born six months after my father's death, I never had a chance to know him. I was raised by my mother, Ethel Kennedy. Forty years is a lot of time. Memories fade and people grow older. I found myself wanting to tell my mother's story about the life she shared with daddy and the life she shared with us, her children. A personal story, but because her life was intertwined with history, more than that. There was just one problem. Why should I have to uh, answer the, all these questions? Uh, well, we're making a documentary about you. <laughs> a bad idea. <laughs> Luckily, I had my brothers and sisters to talk to, and there are a lot of them. My name is Kathleen Hardington Kennedy Townsend. Okay, are you comfortable in that chair? Oh, my ass is asleep and my back hurts. If you can look at me when we're talking. Oh my God. I know, I'm no, so no, sorry. No, 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 <laughs> say it ain't so. You're doing so great. Thank you. I need a lot of encouragement. You're beautiful. If you could just give me a standing ovation every once in a while. You know, Mommy has said that she, of course, that she considered being a nun. But before she married Daddy, she... Of course, before she married Daddy. <laughs> Mommy had 11 children. Well, but she only had 10 children. No, she had 11 children. Kathleen, Joe, Bobby, David, Courtney, Arthur, Terry, Chris, Max, Douglas. Rory. Sorry. I always, I just always forget. <laughs> this is what it's like to be the 11th. There's so many times in my life where people have said, I want to introduce Robert Kennedy's daughter. Oh, it makes me so mad. <laughs> what about the one who delivered us and carried us for nine months and then has been with us the last 40 years? That is so awesome. Well, hey, we've got more people on the panel, and I would like to introduce Mr. John Beasley. He's been Grammy nominated. He's a jazz pianist who's worked with notables like Miles Davis, amazing player. He also, and I'm going to, again, I'm trying not to butcher this, uh, he's the musical director for UNESCO, uh, the International, for the International Jazz Day. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Mr. John Beasley. And John, please tell us about yourself. Thank you. Nice to be here as well, amongst all these esteemed panels, and you guys too. Um, let's see. Well, going back to, I'm, I'm, I don't remember your name, um, the lady from Make Music LA? Dorset. Dorset, said, Dorset said, you know, uh, music education is very important. Well, I'm a, I'm a product of music education. My, my grandfather was a band director. Um, my mom was a band director. Um, my dad um, was a music educator and a player, and I kind of came up with instruments all around and played in band and choir and orchestra all the way through school. And uh, at the time, I didn't realize how uh, that kind of affects, you know, our culture, not just... Um, not just as, you know, oh, yeah, this guy's a great player. He can become a musician or whatever, you know. It, it helps with, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, for one thing, it's community for kids that, are, that aren't jocks 
aren't aren't cool kids. You know, you got the band geeks. You know, but um, you know it 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 affects how you think about art and how dig you want, how deep you want to dig dig into music, art, plays, reading, um, and and right now because we've had a, a lack of it for the past. 30 years since Proposition 13, you can see what's happening with our culture with this, right? Our lack of culture now, right? So anyway, I just want to say that. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, um, but also, you know, those, you know if, we, if we can get it started again, these are you guys' future consumers. These little six-year-olds that can start right now learning about music, drama, acting, you know, who knows, you know, if you, you end up with a respect for art and, you know, you may end up paying for it. They may have paying for it and, you know, helping you uh, sustain a career. Okay, so having said that, I'm a product of music education. I've, I've had a, a really long and windy road myself. Um, uh, I got, I was in a rock band and then uh, I got turned on to jazz and it just took me away. I locked myself in my room, didn't talk to anybody for about eight or nine years, <laughs> and practiced and practiced and listened and listened and listened. And finally, I moved to L.A., and um, I kind of took whatever gig I could get. And doing that, meaning weddings, you know, top 40 gig, country gigs, jazz gigs, um, you know, doing that, I kind of like, uh, you know, not only uh, met other musicians that recommended me for other gigs, but, um, you know, uh, I learned how to play all kinds of different styles, you know, learn how to play R&B, country, and, and uh, later on, I learned that all these influences really helped me as an artist for my own art, my jazz art. You wouldn't think that's true, but it, it really is true. Um, so I did Top 40, and then I, I met a guy um, on a gig. Uh, his name was Mike Jokum. He was a great studio drummer. And he played in this, this, this guy uh, named Dan Foliart, who, who wrote um, music for Happy Days and um, Laverne and Shirley and all these kind of sitcoms, you know. Uh, and he decided, you know, a wacky notion, he wanted to go play the, his TV music live, you know. And so, um, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, I guess the normal guy was too busy doing sessions, right? So I, I ended up doing that gig, and it dawned on me that after a while I should say, listen, Dan, if you want me to keep, you know, doing this gig, you know, you know maybe you could throw some session work at me, right? So he did, and I met the the, uh, the contractor at Paramount, Carl, Carl Fortina, and he started kind of using me. And um, I'm I'm saying this because you know when you when you're mapping out a career, you, have, you really have no idea where stuff's going to come from, right? So I met the the secretary at the Paramount Music Office, who took a liking to me and and introduced me to the head of music. So I'm like 22. So he's <laughs> He's like um, throwing me sound-alike music you know, work, you know. Finally, I went, made my way up to like doing um, Cheers and Family Ties and sitcoms and stuff. In the meantime, I met this guy Carl Fortuna, who's Tina, who starts, you know, calling me for sessions for, for other guys, you know. So um, I guess life is it's about networking, right? So sorry, this is kind of cutting in and out. And let me know if I'm rambling on. My wife is kind of going like, oh. <laughs> she's my director back there. Um, so I'm, I'm doing all this, uh, you know, uh, sitcom work, right? In the meantime, I'm kind of like got a big ego, and I'm going, man, I should be doing movies and dramas and stuff, you know? It wasn't good enough for me at the time, which is, you know, that was my problem back then. Uh, so I decided to cut that out cold turkey. Because at that time, you couldn't get any serious work if you were a sitcom guy. That's just the way it, it kind of was. Um, and it was my way of, 
um, you know, trying to beat the system. Well, it didn't work. I still haven't scored my own movie. But I ended up um, scoring tons of commercials, you know. And, and, and doing that allowed me to keep going on the road with jazz artists, you know. I was still doing session work and working with Freddie Hubbard and um, Miles and being able to go out and, and do that and raise a family, you know, because, you know, I wasn't, you, know, you do a jingle, you know, you're done in one day, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, so that kind of led me to, to all these other things. The jingle world dried up, right? So I, I had met... Um, I met Ricky Minor when I was, um, we were both about 18 and uh, eating candy bars at the union watching, you know, musicians go in collecting checks and stuff out, you know. <laughs> and um, so we always kind of kept in touch. So, you know, one door closes, another one opens, and um, he's got this show called American Idol. So, you know, he asked me to kind of... Uh, the assistant musical director, associate with him. So that kind of led me on the, into this musical directing thing that I've, I've been into lately. Um, um, so I did that for a while, and, and he uh, kind of turned me to some other shows. And then I started uh, being the MD for some live acts, and now I'm a musical director for this International Jazz Day thing. And in the meantime, I guess what's really important to me is I've, I've able... I, I was stubborn enough to kind of keep my own artistry happen through all this and release my own records and, you know, uh, fight my way through getting booked internationally and distribution and lack of promotion. And I'm still out here doing it and trying to make it happen. That make it, that makes sense? Right, I'm going to show a clip of um, some of John's work. The biggest stars in jazz join together to celebrate International Jazz Day. Jazz at the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States.
John Beasley. <laughs> And beside John is Jorge Carante. Uh, he has an extensive history um, producing Paula Abdul even when he wasn't even graduated from high school. <laughs> and he's had a really brilliant career um, as a producer and now as a, as a documentary film composer. Thank you. Um, what an honor to be next to you, John Beasley. Yeah. I play the piano, but <laughs> not even close to that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, so, yeah, my, my career started, I, I guess I was just lucky that um, I had a friend that moved to L.A. while we were writing songs. Um, he was graduating high school. I was still in high school, and he got signed to Capitol Records, and said, hey, send me a cassette with some tracks. I was like, okay. And really almost no, no I didn't know anyone in the industry. I, I didn't even know how to get to anyone or have access. And um, I sent them some music, and it, somehow that cassette from him got into the hands of an executive at, um, at the time was uh, MCA Records, which is now Universal. And... Um, that gentleman, his name is Michael Williams, became my manager, and from there on, um, I started uh, writing and, and, and working with some artists that he had. And um, I got a, before Paul, I think I was 16, I got a production deal with Motown. Uh, and uh, so I did a, I wrote and produced a record there with um, um, a guy named Dave Pensado. Um, I don't know if you guys know Pensado's place. Yeah. So he mixed my first record, the entire record. We worked with Dave, um, who's never changed, by the way, since then. Even, even then, he would tell me, you know, hey, you should buy this microphone or use this. Or he'd show me how to, the SSL would work, you know. Um, and I was just a kid. So that was sort of the entry point into producing. And then from there on, went on to work with... Um, mostly R&B and hip-hop artists, you know, from... Um, I ended up finding a group called Brownstone that signed to Michael Jackson's label and uh, um, Adina Howard and Casey and Jojo, all these, all these artists that um, also in some ways I looked up to as a kid. Um, and and um, after many years of writing and producing records, I started getting songs placed in movies, just mostly through disconnected ways, like my publisher sending something and pitching and getting landing something here and there, um, until I, I met a music supervisor that gave me a really great opportunity um, to write songs for a film called Scary Movie 3. Um, and it was a lot of hip-hop, and it had to be you know kind of cool and legit. And, and we started with one and, or two cues, and it eventually turned into writing pretty much all the songs in the film and, and then doing the soundtrack. Um, and that opened up my world to what writing to picture it, uh, is and, and what it meant to license and really the whole, including the whole business of licensing and writing to, to, to moving images. And, um, and from there on, I was just like, this is where I want to be in terms of just writing to, to picture. And... Um, Continued, uh, ended up um, starting my own licensing company to to be able to pitch my own stuff, and um, and then I got an opportunity through a, a friend to score um, a doc, um, a little documentary called Dirt. It was it was like an environmental film, and I had never scored anything in my entire life. I just had written and produced songs. I didn't even have sounds. I remember going to Guitar Center to like buy, you know, Vienna cymbal, Vienna strings or something, just to have something. I had no idea how to score, how to, you know. And but a little bit kind of like in Miriam's case, the film by chance made it to Sundance, and I was like, oh, okay. And that year we, I went to Sundance for the very first time, and and felt the same way. I was like, I. I First of all, being around filmmakers was so exciting, and and um, and in the documentary world also was was a way to 
to, you, you, I felt like I, I could contribute something to the world as well as, 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 as contributing my music. Um, so it, it felt important in that sense, uh, and, and much different than having worked in records and, and sort of popular music. Um, and, and just went on from there to, to continue writing to pictures, still licensing, and, and that's pretty much the world I live in now, where I'm between writing songs and, and scoring and, and then continue to move forward in there. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Um, we're going to show um, a trailer so, of something that... Yeah, um, so we're just going to show a trailer of this an, uh, of a film that I, I wrote and produced, the end title song, um, that was also recently at Sundance this year. It's called The Bad Kids. kid I want to be my own person and be like accepted as such I never really had a childhood I feel like we're all so much more accepting here it's like a big family good morning good morning how are you guys you awake yet these kids have been hurt so many of them are broken they are all the outcasts Graduating because I had a baby, since I focused on him so much, I can't graduate. Joey, I can't fix the home life. I can't fix it. If Black Rock didn't exist, 82 kids last year wouldn't have got a diploma. If I got one of the sexual assault counselors to come over here, would you be willing to talk? What do you want out of life? I don't want to graduate from high school. Why are you still at home? No, you gotta come to school, honey. You need me to come get you? These kids, with the nurturing and the love and the basic needs being met, can be good citizens. These kids have grit. I've been love, 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 sitting love, love. around, love. watching this world go round and round. Spinning my head till I hit the ground. Take a deep breath, let's leave this town. Leave this town. And I'm just lost. I feel like I'm drowning in my flaws. I've seen things that I never thought I'd see. And I've been a person that I never thought I'd be. And I've been defeated, brought to my knees. Thought about things that you wouldn't believe. Now. And I just wanted to add, um, if we were talking about education, um, having worked in this film, the, the song that came towards the end is the song that I, that I wrote, and I co-wrote it with two of the kids that are in the actual documentary. Uh, and I was so transformed by my experience working with them that I, I was trying to figure out afterwards how I could somehow help uh, as well with, with, you know, with my experience and, and help kids. Um, that come from these places that have no access to music or uh, education or same thing, schools that are incredibly underserved. And uh, I met a, a guy named Dave Valdez who runs the like a like a media summer program in East LA. And so we're partner up this summer. So I'm doing a music production workshop there um, for the whole summer for these kids that sign up. Um, so it's um, it's important to all of you as individuals in the business somehow. If, you find ways to reach out and, and teach and pass on the skill sets that you have. Because um, education is, is really a responsibility for all of us. So, thank you. Thank you, Jorge. That's awesome. So again, I'm going to try to do names right. Casey Shapilkas Dunmore. Did I get that right? That's middle name? Yeah, he said it right. Oh, did I? Wow. My name, <laughs> say it again. It, my name is Casey Dunmore, but a lot of people know me as Spilkes. You did say it right. Oh, man. I, I feel like I got like two out of three right today, so that's awesome. Well, you know, Casey is a producer. He has also done uh, trailer composing for movies such as Transformers, 
uh, Hercules, and of course, one of my favorite Marvel movies of all time, Guardian of the Gal Guardians of the Galaxy. I had to butcher one, right? So, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Casey. Wow, I don't even know where to start. Um, like what John and Miriam was saying, you know, like their paths have just been sort of, you know, you don't know where you're going to go. You know, I kind of got, I, long story short, I've worn many hats. Um, I used to work in the music industry, learned a lot about the business there. Then I got into um, writing music for like film and TV. I've always done music my whole life. A lot of my colleagues never knew I did music on like the record end of things. Um, it was something that I never really thought about and never really shared it with anyone because it was just sort of like my hobby. And you always hear like how people, your hobby just becomes like your life. That's just sort of what happened with me. I didn't really think about it. I had no idea that I would be writing music for like film, TV. It just sort of happened. Um, uh, <laughs> how I how I got into like uh, the film and TV stuff. Um, a friend of mine actually told me to send some music to like MTV. Um, I did like a demo before then with like Quest Records. That was my first, Stacey Turner is actually my first A&R person right over there. Um, you, know, it's, you know, I sent some music to MTV. You know, one of the cats over there, he was just like, yo, this is like really good music. Do you have anything else? And I'm like, okay, sure. You know, I mean, after I sent, just to back up, after I sent music to this person, it was like probably like a year since I like heard anything back. You know, I had like, no expectation. I was like, okay, let me send a CD with like some music on it. And then um, someone from MTV got back to me uh, like a year later. And I was just like, yeah, I was like thrilled. I was like, holy shit, like some dude from MTV like likes my music. That was like a huge deal for me. It was, it was huge. You know, so I just kind of went with it. You know, he's like, hey, do you have like more songs? And I'm like, uh, Sure, you know, well, but I really didn't have any songs. So, like, I started like writing songs, and then he's like, "Hey, man, he's like really good. Do you have more songs?" And I'm like, "Okay, I see where this is going." You know, so I, I was at a point where I was writing like 10 to 20 cues like a week for like this one show. You know, a couple of shows on MTV, a show called Exposed and Next. Um, and then from there, it's just sort of. I, you know, I was just kind of like hustling it. You know, there was like, um, like these uh, uh, resources, like the 411 music guide. Um, and at this point, I was just sort of like, okay, you know, this is kind of cool. Like, you know, someone's wants is using my music in like TV. So like, I started reaching out to like production companies, and someone actually got back to me. Um, this person was at BMG Universal, so I started writing for like their library there. And I'm like, okay, this is really cool. Now I'm like getting, you know, people are giving me money to, like, write music and so forth. And then with, like, the whole trailer stuff, it, it's one of those things where you just never know who you meet in, like, your path with music. I mean, um, it, was a it was from, like, my last venture at a label. One of the producers there started a trailer company. Um, so I started writing with him. He asked me, he's like, hey, you know, would you be down to, like, to jump into this, and I'm like, yeah, sure, let, let me try it, you know, and uh, it's just been going ever since. <laughs> um, let's see, oh man, I'm like so bad at this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a quick note that, that Stacy is the chair of the music business program here at MI, and it's just a, it's a, a a nice cycle of events that Casey is here today, just because like when he first started is when he met Stacy many, many years ago. And I really enjoy just this experience of having all these different paths and, and it's okay not to know, but then it's also, um, you also have to be very confident <coughs> in, in your work and where you want to go to, and also put yourself in those positions and those opportunities for you to, to be able to receive them. And I think every one of these panelists has, has done so in their own way. And um, what I like about Casey is that even though he's very modest <laughs> and humble, he is one of the most gracious people too, and that's why he also gets a lot of these opportunities. And I'm gonna show a little bit of his work. Oh man. <laughs>
You have to understand them. Or we could just blow them to pieces. I need your fighting skills. And 500 tons of awesome. The Civic Red, rated PG 13, real D 3D, and IMAX 3D, July 12th. So amazing, it'll make you slap your mama. First up, the king of the drama. Add to the mix a wonderful song, bird. A voice guaranteed to calm nerves. The strong words come from the mouth of the actor. Magic even got clout with a legendary rapper. And a beautiful lady who brings laughter. Question, would you take the chance and risk it all? And go head to head with a pussy cat dog? Even a man with soul in his past Gotta find a new role for the cash Celebra Cadabra This is not war It's extinction Transformers in 3D Hands. Wait, hold on a second. You're being serious right now? So here we are. Gamora, a great warrior. Drax, a maniac. Rocket and Groot. Oh, yeah. And me, Star-Lord. Who? Star-Lord, man. Legendary outlaw? Forget it. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy. We're just getting started. This war would shake an entire country to its foundation. All right, um, I'm going to go back to Andrea um, because I brought her on this panel because I feel like uh, a lot of us who go to music school, some of us don't um, become musicians. We, we fall into other areas of the industry and we become passionate about a certain area and we really start to to um, draw different ideas and perspectives and, and, and create an, a new space. And that's what Andrea has done. And I want her to go into a couple of the characteristics um, that um, help with uh, novel ideas, especially in the music industry, where um, maybe you're not a musician, but you can participate. So um, I was always a geek. In, in high school, I was, you know, mathematics, physics, and my path was kind of drawn for me already. I was either going to go to law school or economics or IT. And six months in my training to go to law school in Romania, I decided to drop everything and go to London instead. And I went for a multimedia degree because that was the only thing that I thought I could actually study properly in English. My English was okay, you know, just enough to go by. And upon finishing school there, um, my bachelor's, I was fascinated with technology and, and the intersection between music and technology particularly. And I started working in, in the tech industry in London, which at that time was not as, um, not as big as it is now. They were, the government was only just starting to invest in, in you know, entrepreneurs, and that's kind of where I got my start in, in the music industry officially. I was working at a lot of parties, you know, festivals, helping out artist liaison, and I was kind of always next to the industry, but not really uh, taking it very seriously. Um, and then I came across the founder of this music streaming service called Mixcloud that's based out of London. And he gave me a job. He, we really got along, and, and that's kind of that. That was the start of my journey in music. Since I don't work with them anymore, but I'm still kind of in music tech. And 
slowly, slowly, I started learning more about the, the, the core industry and my main responsibilities were along the lines of getting the industry to adopt new technologies and, and I'm pretty much a streaming kid so now finally it's commonly accepted that streaming is a positive. Miriam and I were having a conversation earlier so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose now, now I work in live video streaming as my full-time job paying the bills and she said so as on the side and I dabble a bit with management together with my husband as well. I guess what I've learned from my journey, and not necessarily just in, in my career, but in life in general, is that there is no formula. Very similarly to, to this esteemed panel here, I feel like I don't have any words of wisdom to give because my journey has started much later and, and I feel like I have so much more to learn from them. Um, but at the same time, I would encourage everyone to not not give up because you never know where um, opportunities will take you, where other people you come across um, take you. And and one thing that I've learned is that every person counts and every relationship counts, and it, it's a matter of honing those relationships um, above I, all. And I want to add that Andrea also does a very creative way in in her partnerships as well. Like through She Said So, she connects so many different people together through her panels. Like every month there's a different topic and she'll get um, women who have really forged, you know, the, you know, like pi who are the pioneers of, of, of every aspect of industry. For example, like managers of, of NAS, of, um, you can give a couple other examples. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in mentorship and, and collaboration, and I think that's what we're trying to do at She Said So. So I already mentioned we've been running monthly speaker events in, in London and LA and in various other corners of, of the world, and um, we've always focused on on verticals with the purpose of connecting people who want to grow a career in that in that particular department um, or just for the sake of informing people who don't know how what it is like to get into you know uh, a and r what does it take to become an a r at a label what does it take to become a manager what does it take to find a manager if you're an artist um, some of the some of the people that we had on board are come from all areas of the industry from NAS's manager to uh, Radiohead's manager to um, Spotify, SoundCloud, all the sort of music tech world, ma um, PR labels, you name it. I've, we've been pretty much everywhere and we continue to kind of grow our network in these various areas of the industry with, with the aim of enabling people. And And I want to add that we're not limiting our panels or our audience to women only, but our purpose is to subtly empower more women and, and, and you know, continue the gender conversation because unfortunately it's still worth having. Um, but we've always tried to do that in a very subtle way, just ensuring that there are plenty of women represented on stage, both on the panel side and on the talent side. Um, but we've always ha had kind of a, a mixed crowd. Yeah, and, and you also use technology in the way that you've reached out to people. You have a forum where, where women of all different industries are able to have discussions about their experiences, about um, being a woman in this workforce, and also to discuss other t different types of topics too, um, where they can find areas of, of ways to connect people. Um, and I always thought that was very interesting how you took that aspect of what you've done before in technology and also brought it into other areas that you're, you're involved with. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So we, we still exist as a Google group, basically, which means that if you're part of it and send an email to the entire group, everybody receives it. Some people receive emails as they are sent. Other people receive digests. Sometimes... There tend to be days in which, you know, tens of emails are being exchanged. We're about 1,100 women and uh, around 3,000 overall, a database of, of people subscribed to our newsletter. 
Um, and and what's what's fascinating about what happened because we never really had I never really had an unofficial sort of agenda for for she said so it just kind of escalated. It, it was born out of a very frustrating meeting I had in, in London during my, my job at Mixcloud and I felt small and voiceless and I just wanted to change that and I was I was sure many other girls were in my position and, and I just wanted to bring everyone together and empower each other, give give each other opportunities for projects before you know they are given to to others. Um, so that we actually stand a chance at, at making an impact and, and, and developing a career in the industry. And so this is what she said so is right now. We share jobs before they hit um, the, you know, the, the, the usual suspect job listing sites. We share projects um, if we need a PR for our artist, if we need uh, an agent for the US or for Asia. We share articles, we share knowledge, we debate what's good and what's not in, in as far as music and as far as industry t trends go. Um, and, and I think the best thing about She Said So is that these women feel comfortable and they are given a sense of, of community and a, and a support system that hasn't really been available to them. One of the most touching experiences I've had was when celebrating a thousand members, I sent an email around asking women around the world to submit their experience, to submit a, a video or a photo that that depicts their experience being part of our community. And this woman from Turkey sent her her video saying that she now feels empowered, and that as as a result of having access to our network she decided to, to leave Turkey, which is very much a very oppressive environment still. And, uh, Turkey's kind of split in half. There's, there's the very European sort of Mediterranean influence, and then there's the more, more Middle Eastern kind of culture, cultural restrictions. And she decided to leave um, her job at a, at a very big entertainment company to spend the summer in London and, and kind of create opportunities there for other young ladies who are who are in Turkey and, and, and Istanbul. And that made me really happy. That made me feel like I'm making an impact. And, and that's the, the reason why it all started to begin with. Yeah, I do see this as a new thing where we are building careers as a community. And um, I'm really happy to see this kind of new thing cropping up. And I feel like a lot of the new uh, students now will be able to access those type of opportunities. Um, but I want to pose a question to uh, the rest of the creators. Um, we always have these external forces that um, prevent us from making some steps forward sometimes. And there's also internal ones as well. And I, I want to, um, any, anyone can answer this question is like, how do you resolve those internal crises? Like, uh, maybe it could be um, writer's block. Um, it could be finding the next step or a new situation when one well dries up um, because the, the industry is a constantly changing one where um, maybe, you know, licensing, it doesn't do so well anymore and we have to find a different uh, path. Um, so I, I just wanted um, any one of you to, to speak to that. I was thinking about this even before you asked the question. Um, I think that <clears throat> as children, we, ha you know, we have tremendous imaginations. And I know that my imagination was always my res refuge in every way. Um, after going through college and grad school and having many experiences and then being confronted with many, many obstacles in the music business. What I came to understand was that I needed to put my imagination to another use. You know, and, and imagination and being creative isn't just about creating a work of art or a piece of music. It's about how you live your entire life. What, are you, what is your foundation going forth into the world? And I think if you begin to develop your own creative um, 
just expand on how you use your creativity. It's, you know, I realized that being a musician wasn't all I was. And one of the ways I learned that was by getting nowhere in the business and actually deciding to give it up, and which led me into a whole other path. Um, I got a job at a singing telegram company. <laughs> and even while I was there, I ended up writing songs and creating production numbers. And so it took me in a whole other way while also providing a livelihood. So you have to be extremely flexible, but you also have to use your creativity and, and focus it in different areas of your life. Um, that's my main advice about that. I don't focus my creativity anywhere <laughs> except in music. So when you're someone like me, I don't, I don't know if that makes me super inflexible, which I probably am. Um, it, does, it does kind of uh, bottleneck a lot. And I think, you know, the first thing as far as internal um, blockage is just time. Time away from whatever is causing you problems. Uh, I just did this today. I haven't listened to a song for two or three weeks, which two or three weeks ago I thought the song was brilliant, and then magically the next day, the next minute, it was suddenly shite. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I listened to it for the first time in three weeks today. I've been keeping myself busy doing other stuff. But, and suddenly I realized, oh no, the song is just fine. It's brilliant and it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what Miriam is saying. I don't have that capability. Well, I'm not interested in finding it. See, there I am, inflexible. <laughs> so, like, um, I do find that time away from the thing that's bugging you is is a good recipe for, you know, healing. Um, the other thing that I have sort of... I've sort of spread my creativity around various musical endeavors, though. So, you know, when I first started, it was all piano and singing. Singing was always paramount. Uh, then I picked up acoustic guitar in college, and then I picked up electric guitar, and I spent a long time learning to be like Johnny Greenwood and Brian May. And then... Suddenly, a few years ago, um, Barbara, for Christmas, got me Native Instruments Machine. <laughs> and suddenly, I, I was just like, oh my God, because all that, all that electro, all that hip-hop felt like just kind of like dark magic or something. I was like, how are they doing that? <laughs> and then, you know, a few YouTube videos later, and you're like, oh, that's how they're doing it. So I spend my time learning to play instruments, learning to use software, learning to really push myself in as many different areas of music creation as possible. And I think that's kind of how I wrestle my demons down. You know, uh, learning to produce, learning to play bass is my new conquest. Learning, you know, to make a rock song, learning to make an Irish folk song, learning to make hip hop, learning to make, you know, like, I've just kind of, that's how I've sort of battled with all the, all the certainly the internal creative struggle is just kind of finding finding roads that all lead back to the same place, which is kind of creating music. But once you gain that perspective, uh, it's like a new, it's like a new uh, tool in your toolbox, you know? Now I don't ever need to play fake bass again. You know, I can just play real bass, and it feels very empowering. So that's kind of a, that's what I do. And then I, I also just don't, I just don't pay any attention to the external uh, stones in the way I just ignore those. Usually dig yeah. my way through them instead of going around them as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people use their personalities in, in the way um, that they create and they also address like the external things, for example, like finances. If you are someone who's very independent, who's very, who, lo who loves numbers, who loves the way things work, like sometimes you can do that on your own, but then other, other times like having a team is also a very good thing to have when, when they're, you know, when they have different strengths that can contribute. Um, is, is there anyone in the panel who has like brought on uh, someone in their team to, um, you know, ac access like different types of um, areas that they need within their career? To career? Like a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it also just to sort of add to what these guys are, are saying. Sometimes the obstacles 
uh, are not just music. I, I, I find the music for me is the, is the easy part. Even if it's hard, it's, it's fun, and I, I love the work. I, I even love the struggle, if, for lack of a better word, if you will. But um, sometimes the external stuff, which is the business, and you can't get rid of the business because it's part of how you know, it goes hand in hand with your, with your work. Um, and I, I found that, at least for me, when, one thing that's always worked to my advantage is that I've never been afraid to talk to lawyers or people or managers and just kind of either ask or relate what, what I feel is fair for myself. And, and that's actually helped my creativity because um, I, I just ultimately you're standing up for yourself and that just gives you peace of mind. And that's really important to go back into the studio and feel good about the work that you're doing. So, yeah. And Miriam, you also work with an amazing publicist as well. And oh, yeah. <laughs> um, for most of the, I've been doing this since the 80s, the mid 80s. And I was on my own completely. I, you know, I even wrote my own contracts and stuff. Um, you know, and eventually I did consult a lawyer and he helped me fix a few things. But um, I, I developed a strong understanding early on on how to stay independent, and one of those was to own my music. It's very, very important, so I can't stress that enough, especially in today's marketplace. Own your own music, don't give it away. Don't uh, make sure that you're with a, you know, BMI or ASCAP or CSAC. Um, in terms of my publicist, so... I met Chandler at Sundance one summer. A friend, another composer friend of mine, said, "Hey, I've been working with this publicist, and you know, you should talk to him." And I, and it never occurred to me to have a publicist because in documentaries, the last thing I ever want to do is get out in front of the film. Um, it's just a different world, you know. It's not we're not creating um, stars. You want to have a brand, you want to be recognized, but you don't want to overshadow the film in any way because these films are very serious and usually have important content. So I didn't really understand why I should have a, a publicist. But um, <laughs> one time I, I was at, you know, the whole Emmy and Oscar process is just has been a very big mystery to me. It was. And one time I was talking to a friend of mine, and she has three Emmys, and I said, so how does this work? She goes, well, Miriam, you have to have a publicist. <laughs> so that's when I got interested in a publicist, because I really didn't understand how any of the awards stuff worked. And I thought, well, I should at least try, you know. So um, anyway, I met Chandler. But what actually came of it was quite different than what I expected. Um, he became sort of my cohort. Um, I'm very different than his other clients. I'm older, and I'm not trying to build a career anymore. I'm, I'm pretty happy with where I am. But what he does help me do is, like, we'll sit down, and I'll go, Chandler, how do you get to be at these film music festivals? And he'll go, oh, well, you know. So I've expanded my activities to the other things that I'm interested in. Um, I get plenty of work on my own, but I do want to travel, and I, and I love doing panels. I love, you know, teaching. And so I've been expanding that part. And what he's able to do is get me out there in an international way. It's just been really fun. So I'm, I went to Spain, and now I'm going to go to um, Germany. And um, so all these things, you know, it helps to have a story about yourself, you know, a narrative. And um, it also coincided with the whole idea that there weren't enough women composers. So many people internationally are interested in my narrative now. So it's been pretty cool. And, and meeting all these young women who are aspiring all over the world. And, you know, it helps for them to see someone who's had a career working for like 25 years. Um, so, yeah, so Chandler and I do that kind of stuff. I don't really, you know, and as for the Emmys, it turns out for the news and documentary Emmys, you don't need a publicist anyway, so, because they actually, in their process, you know, there's two different TV academies. One of them's on the East Coast and one of them's on the West Coast, and the primetime Emmys are in Hollywood, I mean, they're in L.A., and there's a whole campaign, you know, I'm just sharing this with you, because, I mean, I didn't know this till like, a few years ago. <laughs> um, you know, people actually do, like, a campaign like the Oscars. They spend a fortune on publicists and they go out and they have all these events and it's just a crazy rat race. And in New York, they have the News and Documentary Emmys, which is a separate... It's, it, the Emmy is the same, but they decided to have their own branch because they were getting short shrift in, in the Hollywood game. So 
news and documentaries have their own categories and all their own um, events, and they have their own awards process in which there's these people, you don't know who they are, but they're, they're judges, and they actually pick the nominees and decide who wins. You know, so um, there's no reason to have a campaign, which I think is kind of cool, so I save money. All right, great answers, folks. Uh, I got a question kind of in general. Now, most of you have alternative careers. You started off kind of from the music standpoint of producing, making records, uh, but you also do other elements in the business. Where do you think the music business is going? I'm, I'm putting this out to all the panel. Uh, is this going to be a requirement for musicians that are going to M, you know, MI? Are they going to need to look at having vertical, uh, uh, you know, Careers, I guess, if you'd say? Very good question. I always have this discussion with my friends, like Casey, <laughs> uh, and Barb, and just in general. And my, my take on, on a 21st century music person is someone who's able to do many things and do them well. I think that's what's really different. When I, I came up, you know, also, I was very young, but it was in the analog days. And even my first record that I produced, you know, I, I, I would, did the demos at home, then we'd go into a studio to record, and then someone incredible like Dave Pensada would mix them, and everything would sound great. And now uh, I have to be Dave Pensado, I have to be, you know, a producer, I have to be the songwriter, I have to, be, I have to wear many hats, including the business side. So there's... There's really also not, not an excuse. Even if you're working with, a, with an attorney who can help you read the contracts and you're working with a manager, um, today is also the difference is, is m most artists that I talk to, especially even young ones, are very well informed. The information is out there. So, you, know, you can Google things. You can come to panels like this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of access. Yeah, but it's, it, it's to... To really shape a career in, 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 in this fast-changing world of, of the music industry, I think the, the people who will survive are the ones that are the most well-informed when it comes to the business. Um, you, have to know, you have to know it. You have to know what publishing is. You have to know how to create splits um, and, and have that dialogue with the people that you collaborate. And then you have to know how to mix a great-sounding song or, or a musical cue. Um, there's no such thing as a demo anymore. It's, I have that same conversation with friends who work you know, at, at, at record labels. They're, they're not expecting to hear a demo anymore. You know, when you're submitting something for uh, whether it's Justin Bieber or you're an artist or whoever you're trying to you know, submit a song for, it has to already sound like a record. So that's another big difference. I could, I've had meetings with Clive Davis you know, and he just sits down and we listen and, you know, the demo is like a, a rough piano with, you know, maybe a really good vocalist, but, but still in a really rough form. And Clive would go, I get it. I really like it. Let me give it to Whitney Houston or whoever, you know. And um, now that's non-existent. Now it's like, let me hear it. Yep, that sounds like a hit record. And, you know, send it to so-and-so, give me an instrumental They'll record it somewhere in another state. They send, you know, they'll send it back to you. You may do some additional production, and then it goes to, you know, to get mixed, and maybe you mix it as well. Um, so it's definitely more hands-on. There's no more excuses about not knowing how to make these things happen. Uh, like Brandon was saying, everything's on YouTube, literally. Uh, and um, much more is required of you, but that's just how it's changed, in my opinion. I think it's really interesting what you said about how um, there's no such thing as a demo anymore. And it, it's, it's, it's kind of frustratingly true, but it's also kind of amazingly true at the same time. It depends on your outlook, and I know that fluctuates for me. But, yeah, when I start a track at home, I, there's, there's, no, there's no point in thinking, oh, well, then, you know, this will become... No, it's just like your little, your little beat right now is going to basically be on the finished thing. Your demo vocals that you're recording right now are very likely going to be the final vocals. And I had to learn this in a kind of a really hard knock way. A couple of years ago, I was, I was taking some meetings, and I was like, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. And I would play my stuff 
which was, you know, still in demo form. And um, I was kind of expecting more like what you were saying with Clive, where it's like, oh, I understand what this is going to be. No. Not only do they not understand, uh, they know the difference, which is kind of, ama- it's kind of amazing. Like you're talking to some publisher or some executive, and because you're, and you, you're a musician, you're a creative person, you think to yourself, oh, well, they, you know, they don't know. But they know the sound of a hit record or a, just an awesome sounding record, which is usually mastered and mixed like really well. So, you know, I, I got, like, just got battered around in the tides of, of that for a season. You know, it was like fall and winter. And I felt so haggard at the end of it. And I, and I realized, I was like, I am never playing anything that isn't completely professionally, absolutely 100% done for anyone ever again. Because that way, when you bring your shit in and it's like rock solid, you know, then you don't, you, there's, no, there's no doubt in your mind, there's no nothing. But definitely don't leave anything up to the imaginations of every, anyone else. It's your imagination and it needs to be done. And uh, yeah, like I've been whining in the last few months in the same way just to myself, not to anyone else. It's just like, wow, yeah, like I'm an artist, I'm the performer, I'm the musician, I'm the... The, the, the comp guy, I'm craft, you know, I'm making macaroni and cheese for myself, uh, I'm the producer, it just, you have to wear all these hats, and it is extremely fun, and it's extremely exhilarating, um, but it is, it can get really exhausting when, when, when you're building the Lego set, and you're also building the pieces for the Lego set, you know, so everybody has to be Puff Daddy and Jay-Z now, sorry. Can I just jump in on this real quick? What? Oh, I was just going to jump in on this too. Like, what these guys are saying, you definitely have to, like, do everything. I mean, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, The best thing that you could do is just learn as much as you possibly can about the music industry from every aspect, from the business. I mean, I started out as an intern. Like, I was, like, mailing posters to, like, clubs. And um, I worked with other interns, and they would give shit. Like, why am I doing that? Why, am, why aren't I A&R? And it's just kind of like, I'm thinking, like, well, someone's got to do it. You know, so, like, I would be in the office with the publicist doing it. You know, but I kind of understood that, that this is something that needed to get done on whatever level. And it applies. I take that approach to how I run myself and, like, my business and, like, my brand, because working... You know, interning for a record label, then eventually working for a label, I really got to understand how the record industry works. You know, be it, you know, getting yourself on radio, pressing up CDs, you know, one sheet, you know, record, just everything. And then I slowly got into, like, the licensing world. And just to be straight with everyone, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Like, I didn't know what a cue was when I first started doing this. Like, I had songs that were, like, three minutes long and... They had, like, fade-outs at the end, and, you know, someone told me, like, you know, let's make them shorter, you know, make a sting, and I'm like, what's a sting, you know, and the internet wasn't, like, really big when I was getting into it, so I kind of had to, like, learn how to figure it out, I'm like, okay, a sting, it sounds like it just stops, sent something in, it stopped, oh, that's great, okay, cool, I figured what that was out, you know, and same thing with, like, the production end of stuff, you know, I went to, like, recording school, because I thought I was one of those dudes that, like, knew I had, like, a four-track, and I had, like, keyboards and stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know what I'm doing. No, you have to educate yourself on just everything, you know, whether it's production, you know, learn your craft. You know, um, I play piano, not like this cat right here, you know, but I took lessons. You know, I played, like, the viola, so like that. I think that's also given me an edge with my music, you know, as I played in an orchestra, so, like, I know how to, like, you know, arrange strings. I'm not just going to sit at a keyboard and just start hammering out you know, just parts everywhere. I know how to, like, place my instruments, and I think that's definitely have, has given me the edge on creating, you know, like, the theme song for the Toronto Raptors, you know, stuff with strings. So, you know, if someone comes to me, you're like, hey, we need, like, a symphonic hip-hop track, I feel like I have a little bit more than, like, than the average cat who's, like, using, like, samples and stuff, you know, because I can actually play the parts, and, like, I hear it, and I'm like, okay, that works. But, um... Yeah, just learn as much as you can about just the music industry. I mean, just everything. Don't put anything aside, you know, because it all comes into play 
down, down the line, you know, because eventually you will be working for yourself, you will be working with other people, you know, and, and then you get to a point where you're just like, okay, I can't do this, let me delegate, you know, this to this person who is really focused on that because I know I just want to focus on music and just being creative. Yeah, and to build on that, in spite of, <laughs> in spite of your not wanting to be flexible, um, I think that particularly now, I mean, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and it, the rapidity of change and evolution in our industry is just exponential now. I mean, like, things are changing so fast. Like, you think you understand the marketplace. You think you understand the technology. And it's just all of a sudden there's some new thing. And you really, if you want to be able to position yourself to be able to sustain your your career and financially, you have to understand what the marketplace is. Otherwise, you'll be making a product that nobody needs. and uh, Or someone else will be doing it in a format, you know, that, um, that, that you don't know how to deliver. So, I mean, I've really had to learn that, you know, because I started way back also in the analog before there was even synchronization. You know, people were using the Knudsen book. And then, you know, all the way up till now where I don't even, sometimes I don't even meet the filmmakers. We're doing everything online. I'm delivering online. I'm getting my notes online. Sometimes we Skype. I mean, you just have to, you know, I suggest you have a server, you know, so that you have your own private place where things are safe and secure and people have access to it. I mean, you just got to stay on top of the technology and stay with it because everybody else will be speeding up. And if you're too slow, <laughs> you know, so I mean, sometimes we just want to disappear into the studio. But honestly, I think it's good to ha it gives you a very varied life. Like like there are days I'm doing business for a little while and then I go back in the studio and I'm writing music. Then I got to do a recording session or travel somewhere and teach. It's kind of nice to have it broken up like that. All right, I got one. Oh, Brendan, you have a No, I was just going to say, I want to know what John has to say about all this. Yeah. <laughs> Practice more. <laughs> I think there's something to be said for, you know, chasing trends and, and all that. But I also think there's a, you know, a being the trendsetter, you know, and, and embracing your inner creativity and 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 trusting that and like these guys say you know um seeing it to the very end you know with all your skills that you have you know with production making the track sound like a like a master everything should be a master even if it's just a a piece for solo viola you know make it Make it own it, make it yours. Um, you know, um, there's going to be so many people um, in this day and age of library music that you know are going to be okay. We need something like this. We need something like this. We need something like this. There's a, a huge glut of that and that and that and that and that. So to me, you know, why not go for something different? You know. Um, here I am I sound like an old guy like back in black back in the in the bebop area era and early R&B and the 60s and the Laurel Canyon stuff it was cool to be individual you had to have your own sound right and and um Movie composers were like that, too. Jerry Goldsmith does not sound like John Williams, who does not sound like Tom Newman. They have a sound. And unfortunately, the business is kind of not slanted that way anymore, you know, um, with the, you know, everybody's chasing temps of somebody else. Even, you know, I've been working with Tom Newman for 30 years, and, you know, he's still, he's, he's chasing his own temps. It drives him nuts, you know? <laughs> But but I think you know you know how many people are you got how many people are like creative people uh, like musicians and writers, songwriters. Oh, so most of you guys, okay. And the other uh, you guys are music business kind of people and stuff. Okay, very cool. All right. So so um, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, that, that, I recall one of my mentors in college. 
he he told me two things in one afternoon that was just like a total sock in the solar plexus, you know? When you're when you're really young, you don't want to you don't want to hear stuff, and when someone that you really respect says something to you, you're like, okay, I'm gonna listen to this. And one of the things he said that afternoon, and I'm gonna paraphrase, and it was just a simple fisherman analogy, um, where I must have asked him some kind of naive question. He said, you know, um, basically speaking to being true to yourself, um, you. One of my big projects in the last few years has been, okay, I need to simultaneously remain true to myself and satisfy myself creatively as an artist, but also simultaneously do stuff that is going to be relevant and that people will want to listen to and pay for and yada, yada, yada. And um, one of the things that he said was, you know, if you cast your line right down here... um, you know, you're probably not going to catch anything. And uh, the tide's going to bring stuff in and out. And, and you, if you catch your, catch your line, like, right here, you might catch something, but it's just going to be like that fish. And he said, the best advice I have for you is to cast your line as far out as possible so that in time, when the tide catches up to your line, you know, something might catch. And I never, I didn't even describe that nearly as eloquently as he did. Or as simply, but I never forgot it. Uh, it was actually kind of inspiring in a way, where it was kind of like, okay, I need to stay true to myself. Um, but I do think that you do need to kind of be casting your line into the future. Maybe not all the time, but if you're not if you're not trying to make that next level sound, you know, that next level shit that they're always talking about, like that's something that should be that's a burner that should always be on on your creative oven. Um, and I never forgot that. And I think that's kind of important to remember, is to cast your line out as far as you can um, so that, you know, people can catch up to you, hopefully, possibly, you know. Anyways, Great go fishing. Guys. Great information. So I kind of want to play off of this with one last question for me, at least. And I want John to go ahead and pick up that microphone again because I'm going to start off with you, but it's to the whole panel. We've seen a lot of our icons pass away this year. I mean, most recently we've seen Prince. I mean, the list goes on. We've seen Eagles be removed. This industry is so saturated. I mean, you can get your, you know, the good news is you can get your music out. You can get yourself heard. You can get uh, all these wonderful things that you're able to do out and about. You've got Reverb Nation. You've got YouTube. You've got Spotify. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, Mixcloud, you know, we've got the whole thing going on. But the challenge is there's a lot of noise. A lot of things going on. There's a lot of, of, you know, chaotic stuff. John, because you've worked with such an icon like Miles Davis, who was just so influential to so many players in this world, do you think that there's a possibility to have those kind of icons with the next generation? And if so, how do those people rise above the noise to the whole panel? Well, I think now, you know, music has a fraction of the value uh, during as miles time music right now you guys is it's not valued there's no value in it you know monetarily or even culturally like it like it was back then you know i think talent wise for sure there's people out there they're doing it but you know you talk about youtube and, and stuff you know you know how much it costs to make a master how much time you know and if that's the way you have to do it, and then you get half a cent from Spotify and YouTube, I mean, I, I don't know how it's going to sustain, how to sustain itself, you know? I mean, that's scary, right? So um, I think that, that, man, talent is living on, I mean, like, like, like crazy. Now, how to get it out there, um, I've never been good at that, so... You know, I, 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 I do my own music because I have to do my own music, you know. But, you know, in a way, I, I make a living, you know, helping other people realize their music, you know, as a sideman or an MD or as an arranger, you know, because, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I think it's, it's tough because kind of what you were also saying, John, 
is how back in the day um, it was not just cool to like have your own sound and be like your own thing that's like nothing else like Crosby, Stills and Nash and Bowie and everybody and you know you touched on it briefly just how the business end isn't really going in that direction I, I feel like you know, without being, I don't mean to sound so pessimistic and stuff, but yeah, as far as like icons, you know, the reason Prince was an icon is because there's just, there just is one Prince. There's just is one MJ, and they sort of just kind of come along. And I think those people are going to have a lot of trouble in this economy. And that's kind of what it comes down to, right, is the economy of making music now feels a bit more assembly line than it does like, oh my God, there's this person and they have this vision. How can you explain, like, how can you explain Pitbull getting $400 a seat in an arena, you know, compared to like, you know, you know somebody at the Blue Well, you know, that's, that's playing some deep stuff, you know. There's a real divide in what's considered our cultural music and, and art you know and that kind of goes back to music education and arts education you know it's coming full circle and that i'm a i'm a grammy board member and i am chairman of the foundations committee um which handles uh, part of his music cares but also grammy in the schools and stuff like that so what we found out is that um in California, it's state law, mandatory state law, that they have to provide arts education in every school. It's not being enforced. And, and also, some schools don't want it because it creates more work for them and blah, blah, blah. Or they, maybe they don't have the infrastructure. There's, there's all kinds of layers. So um, um, I'm saying this because, you know, there, there is hope. People are trying to get this happening. And, and I just think that um, we have to hammer that, you know, uh, you know, music does have value. And, you know, to pay an engineer to come make it sound like these guys are talking about, you know, um, to pay for talent. You know, right now, you know, I, I just did a, I, I have a record coming out in August, right? You know, uh, I, it's with a record company, a good record company. They gave me a budget. But... I mean, with all due respect, the lawyer, the studio, um, the photographer, the agents, I mean, making like, you know, taking all the budget. I can't even pay musicians who are making the music. So we all have to like really try to try to turn this around and, 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 and speak out about this, about what it really takes to make music, you know. And why you like a, Why do you like that record? Ask some your friend. Why do you like that record? Do you know how that record was made? You know, so it's an education thing. Um, I like to add that also what I see that's changed drastically um, is continuing on this idea of wearing many hats. Um, a lot of the music I personally listen to is is not really top 40 radio. And I've noticed in that world, and I have friends that are independent artists that are doing fairly, they're sustaining themselves fairly well. Um, but it's because they've built businesses around their music, their own business. Um, it may be a small business, but it works better for them than to be signed to major labels. And I, and I have friends that could be signed and have had offers. Um, I personally come from that same world. I had a publishing deal with EMI Music, uh, and I, you know, when I recouped that advance, which is also a rare occurrence for most people, I realized, well, if I can pay them back with my own music, then I should just own it from now on. And I started thinking more in terms of building a business around my music. So. That's how I started doing my music licensing company. And it's a tiny catalog of just my own stuff, but it's more meaningful. And in the long run, I've actually been able to 
pay my bills and be and, 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 and be self-contained while some friends that have publishing deals still owe money and they're stuck in these deals forever. So not to say that that's bad, but that being signed to a major or anything, it, it's, a, it's a bad thing. But I think the difference also in the 21st century is building businesses around them. Now, I'm, I, I've always sort of been a little bit entrepreneurial about things. So... Um, so, so I, I also thought like, oh, this could be fun having my own thing and kind of just, you know, so, you know, licensing my stuff and it, it, it's kind of like when you buy a house and it's, it's fun to like paint your doors and start to fix things around your house and it's a tiny little house but it doesn't matter. So that's how I felt and that's how I looked at it and I'm realizing that the successful artists um, are doing a lot of things independently uh, but also, they're building a business around them. Like, I, re I really like this DJ producer girl named Toki, Toki Monsta. Um, and, like, y you see, like, she just, like, writes these tracks out of her, you know, little apartment somewhere in Koreatown and, and has built an incredibly successful business touring with her music. And now she's part of the big festivals and doing all these different things. And it, she owns it all, and it's all her, her vision. Um, and it's her label, so... It can be done, but it, again, it all takes a lot of work. Eventually, you, you bring people in to help you, but it can be done if, if you're willing to do the work. And I think that's the look of a 21st century music person. Most definitely. I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think as artists, we all have a decision to make about how our life is going to be. I know that early on, I realized that I'm very, very good at generating work. I could be running a huge business, like a, you know, not huge, but I mean... I could have taken all these jobs and hired other composers and become a manager of other composers. But that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the person who writes the music. So instead, I chose a path. I'll be a small boutique. I'll work on only the things I want to work on, and it'll just be me. And I'll, you know, I'll make it work with the budgets that I have. I figured out the ways to make it work and still use all live players and still have an engineer mix. I mean, I think we all have to make these choices, and I hope that the up-and-coming... Uh, artists will make informed choices. Um, it's very easy to find yourself on an assembly line. I remember early on, I found myself feeling like I was just on a gr in a grinder. I just felt like, my God, I just get up and work for 14 hours, and then I get up and do it again every single day. How am I going to, you know, these these deadlines and these, you have to start to create boundaries, you know, like, that doesn't work for me. I'm going to die young if I do that. And I'm not even going to be that happy doing it because I can't do good music. Good music doesn't happen on those kind of deadlines. I mean, some people can pull it off, but you can't do it consistently over a 20-year career. You know, you're going to fall apart. So it's very important to, you know, I feel like artists have to start making conscious choices and knowing that something is not the road to go down. Like, don't give up all your publishing just because you're trying to get a gig if you give up your pu publishing, it's self-defeating because they're not paying you anything up front and you'll never see any back end. How do you build a sustainable career that way? So that's what I was saying. You, you need to understand the, where you are and how things work. And when you make conscious decisions, I mean, the people that aren't, are going down those other paths are driving the prices down for everyone. I mean, the buyers know that there's a 1,000 people coming into L.A. every day that want to write music for, for media. And that a lot of them will, I mean, I've even heard of people paying to do it. You know, you, pay, you hire an orchestra and pay them yourself. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that I hope that you're learning, and I hope you've heard everybody's, what we've been saying. The only way it changes is, is from us. We have to not do those things that are destroying the industry. Um, on that note, I'd also like to add that as an artist, you should pick your battles. Um, creatives by nature tend to be jacks of all trades and, and that's highly encouraged and you should definitely continue pursuing that but you should also pick your battles. One thing that I've learned by being exposed to all these different verticals within the industry is that they each formed a, a sub-community so if you're trying to be an artist that's going to chart on top 40 radio that's very different. It's a very different battle from being a house and techno producer, right? So you have to you have to pick your battles first and, and focus on that sub community. Learn how it works, 
doing PR for a soul singer is very different from doing PR for someone who sings on a bunch of EDM tracks. And try, try to find your niche and perfect that and then make yourself known for that specific thing, whether it's you know playing a specific instrument or creating a particular type of beat. And, and always keep, keep that multifaceted aspect to yourself growing at the same time without worrying too much what, you know, what the story that you're selling is because that will ultimately feed into your, into your craft anyway. And, and most um, I iconic artists, um, the, the reason they are iconic, or at least that's how I see it, is because they have been exposed and they have been nurturing their craft with all these different influences and they play multiple instruments and they sing and they are incredible performers on stage as well. But they started off by being great, by being famous at one thing and then they continued build, building on that. And I think the press and, and the industry loves these stories, these special stories that brought some someone from being, you know, a small town, um, uh, a jazz singer all the way to the stages of the O2 Arena or so on. Let's give a hand for all the great answers to these questions. <laughs> At this point in the panel, we'd like to open it up to you folks because honestly, your lives are going to probably be the most impacted as you're starting to, to grow in your careers and you're starting to launch all these amazing creative, business oriented stuff. So uh, we'd like to any one of you to kind of come up. We've got uh, mics on both sides of the, the aisle here. So this gentleman right here is going to be the first one up. Nice. Please state your name and uh, your question. Hello, my name is uh, Lucky Bell. Um, I'd like to be a composer. Um, and I have a little bit of a preface before my question to give it a little kind of, uh, of an idea of what I'm asking. Um, I work here for 40 hours a week um, handling the social media. Um, I go to school here for 12 hours a week um, for composition. Um, I try to get at least two placements every week um, for being a composer. Um, I play in three different bands. Um, I tour at least twice a year. Um, and my question is, for each and every one of you, because you have um, different careers and different pathways that led you to where you are now, I'm a very calculating person. And I find that my calculations end up getting me further than my creativity. The creativity is something that just exists within me. So it's not something that I am ever worried about. I'm always going to create something. But it's the calculating as far as like going to specific events, um, like the Grammy U events, uh, which I'm a part of. Going to, um, uh, speaking of like women empowerment, I went to uh, Cine Females which is an event specifically for empowering women in the movie industry. Um, and I meet a lot of contacts, but I find that the creativity is something that I do just by myself. It's the calculating and kind of, like you said, throwing out the line into the future. Um, that's actually what gets me further. Do you think that that's a good career decision, or do you think it should be a combination of the two? And if so, what percentage? All right, you say that you want to be like a composer, but you're also playing in like bands, you're doing this, doing that. Yeah. You're stretching yourself all over the place. One of my mentors gave me like the biggest piece of advice, like right when I started working for myself. And basically he said, you know, yo, Casey, you're very talented at many different things. You know, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this and do that. But focus on one thing and one thing only and that'll be like your thing. And I took that and I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna focus on music, you know, just straight up, just work on music. I mean, I had like some rough times, you know, but I did what I had to do in order to just focus on the music, you know? So if that's really what you wanna do, if you wanna be like a film composer, just really focus on that, you know, like hone your craft like so hard on that, you know what I mean? Just really, learn everything you need to know about film composition, you know, but just focus on that. I mean, you can still do, like, the bands and all that other stuff, but, you know, you're spreading yourself thin. So that's also, my... That's really great, <laughs> really great advice. Also, I, I always...
tell people when it comes to networking, um, for example, if you're a composer, be around filmmakers. If you're hanging out with other composers, that's great for camaraderie and to learn and to kind of, but you're, it's, it's not going to necessarily move your career forward. So um, I've, I've learned that too, is just you know, be around filmmakers. If you're singers and songwriters, be around publishers or um, you know, people that are, can, can place your songs or, or artists you know, that can record your songs, producers that you can collaborate with so that you can go in the studio get those songs made, especially if you're like a, a singer-songwriter and, and um, uh, aligning yourself with producers who are working with other projects would be a really, really smart thing. Cause, and especially people who, are, who have things in the pipeline, like, hey, I'm, I'm working with this artist. Hey, can I come in and write a song with you? Can, can you know, we collaborate? And um, a lot of hit records are made that way, especially today. Um, but yeah, so be, be around filmmakers. Go to Sundance Film Festival. Go to South South by Southwest. LA um, Film. LA Film that, thank you. That's an, you know, but but AFI. You know, producers who produce these films. Uh, See, who, part of, like, the focus, like, yeah, who who hire composers. And so, I think there's a couple things. I uh, I I don't disagree with the focus comments. I think that's ultimately necessary. But, you know, when you said I have, I'm going to preface the question, it's like, I'm doing all this stuff. And obviously you got to work. But even if you got to go hungry, if you need more time, like, don't work as much. Don't work 40 hours of work. You do work 20 and then compose the rest of the time. Or, you know, like, um, Every, you got to make sacrifices, and it's it's interesting. You filled your life up with so much music and stuff to generate music. Even even your job is a way to generate music. Obviously, you need to eat, so you have energy to make music. But yeah, I, I'd say you gotta you gotta shave some time out, you know, to do this. And if what you say is like accurate, like I want to be a film composer or, or write music to picture, I think that's where we're all kind of gathering from your from what you said. Um, I think if you, one of the things that you should do is not just surround yourself by filmmakers. It's cool to go to Sundance. It's cool to do the South by Southwest stuff. I would, I would, I would, I would start with a film school. I wouldn't. I would definitely start with a film school. You know, because students have films that need music in it, and that's like where you're going to cut your teeth the hardest, you know, um, is, is working with people that are in a similar boat as you. It, it's cool. It, I mean, obviously you shoot for the pie in the sky and stuff, but um, if you're going to go hungry, you should, you should go hungry with people that are also really hungry, you know. Um, that's, that's my thought on it. Yeah, thank you guys. Sure. All right, we've got time for one more question. Make it a short one because we're running out of time. Hello, my name is Zachary Calderon, and I just want to thank you guys for, for uh, taking the time to come here and sh share your wisdom with us. We, we really appreciate it. My question is, um, I speak with a lot of uh, uh, artists that struggle with um, networking and, and being assertive and pitching themselves because they spend so much time to themselves composing at their rigs, you know, secluded, you know, living in a place like Los Angeles where uh, everybody s surrounding you is just as qu equally qualified and, and talented and it's competitive, the one thing that seems to set the people apart is whether they're char charismatic or they have the work ethic or, or, or some other quality that I haven't quite identified yet. So how does the more introverted composer uh, sort of create opportunity for themselves in an arena that where, where they face other composers that, that are just as equally qualified, that are, that are maybe better, inherently better at networking than, than themselves. Closed mouths don't get fed. Someone told me that once, and, I, and it rings really true. Um, you, you know, I, I, I've never been one to um, harass people or call, you know, or, or send a, a, a bunch of unsolicited music. Um, but um, what's helped is I also have to take time to, to learn who, who these 
people that I want to reach to, whether it's an executive or a music supervisor, what they do, what shows they work on, and really learn about the people that you may want to talk to. And, and so that when you reach out to them, if you see them somewhere, um, you can politely just approach them and say hello, and at least you'll have a conversation about something that you know about them. And I think they will definitely appreciate that, and that at least opens up the door for them to want to hear your stuff. And then, you know, gently send some things that way. And, and let them be. Let a lot, you, you have to let things be because I just hear all the time, you know, they're just barrage, like you, like you know, you know with, with so much stuff. And, and I know that they listen to stuff. I've had situations where I've submitted music, and I, I'll hear back six months later. And they'll say, hey, that was really great. I love that song. I want to use it for this project I'm doing now. And I'm cool, you know. Uh, I've made a lot of friendships by just also being just a cool person to hang, meaning, you know, I'm not always talking about music and pitching, and I'm, I'm trying to develop personal relationships because these are people, you know. Um, so think, you know, think about that, just trying to learn about the people that you admire or people you're trying to reach, and that'll make it easier, I think, even if you're an introvert, to, to have a conversation so that you're just not kind of cold calling or approaching from, from scratch. And then building on that, you know, I remember in the early years when people wanted to hear music, and I, it's like a chicken and egg. They want to see something you've scored, but you haven't scored anything you're proud of. I think the most important thing you can be doing is, is also getting, scoring as many things as you can, and the film school idea is terrific because some of those kids come out and they go right to a festival, and there's, now there's all these student awards. The most important thing is to, you know, if you're not so socially adept, you've got to develop the music so that it speaks for itself. And the only way that it can be heard or seen is if you do something. So, you know, if, if I were... Uh, felt more socially challenged, I would, I mean, and I did this anyway. I just got my hands on anything I could, scored it, something I would be proud of, you know, and, and then you can at least start, it gets out there, it does festivals, then you can talk about, yeah, I did this film and it won the Student Academy Award, and, you know, you can start to develop something that you have to show your work, and believe me, the music speaks for itself, you know, oftentimes, you don't have to be, I mean, being charismatic makes it easier in some ways, but, um, the work really does speak for itself. Many of the top composers are not big social butterflies. <laughs> yeah, I think you can be super charismatic, but you can still be terrified. You know, like when it comes down to it, every single uh, meeting I've ever had, not to say that I'm super charismatic, but I am. But yeah, I, you know, my hand is like freaking out, you know? So it doesn't even matter if you're super charismatic. If you're nervous, it goes out the window. So the thing that... You know, once again, like Miriam said, like I said, work with people at your level all the time. Th this is advice that I did not follow when I was young. And I, I paid a pretty hefty price for it. And um, that's super important because, yeah, these people are all coming up and they, you will all teach each other how not to be bozos. You know what I mean? So that's, that's where y you just kind of have to educate yourself. In, in, and, and there's no class in the world that can teach you or that will teach you. And um, I think working with people at your level, working, they're all nervous too. They don't know how to talk to a composer. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking is also, yeah, don't be the guy that's like telling. Be the guy that's asking. Yeah. What can I do to help you? You know, what can... What can, what does your project need? Oh, well, you know, yeah, so, oh, you want that? Well, we can do this, and we can try this. You know, um, that's just something that's really important is, is never quite being above, there, there should be nothing too, too degrading, you know what I mean? Like if you're doing like a free thing and everybody else on the project is getting paid, you know, like that little comic book trailer thing that I showed, the bounty thing, I, I did that for free just because my buddy wanted to do it, and now Dark Horse wants to talk to me to score their trailers. So it's just like, um, that sort of thing. Just be on a, be, work with people on your level for now, and they're going to be somebody someday, and you'll be somebody with them. Um, but yeah, like I'm terrible at networking. I'm a horrible antisocial person, and I get so terrified. It's like stage fright. It's the exact same thing. So yeah, I don't know how to fix that. 
but I, but I do think that just doing work is, that's, just the, that's the gateway. Just do work. Do work. It's the gateway app. Can I just throw one more thing at this guy real quick? Just, because I get where you're coming from. You know, just be you. Like, be yourself. Like, don't worry about all that other, like, oh, you know, this person, whatever. You know, meet people. You know, like Jorge says, you know, you just never know what someone will be doing in the future or what they're doing now. You know, and just kick it with someone. You get to know them, and the music definitely, you know, has to, you know, hold itself up. Is there so much music out there? So many talented people, and just have confidence in yourself. You know, but the biggest thing is just be you. You know, if you're shy to talk to someone, you know, cool. Let them know, like, yo, you know, how could, you know, how can we get to work with each other, or how can I get to know you? You know, and just take it from there. Relationships. All right. Thank you very much for all the great questions here. Oh, wait, First, John. Oh, John, John had one. I'm sorry. You got to get one from everyone. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that the music business is a total social business. It's all word of mouth. You know, you show up on time. That's like what Woody Allen, ninety ninety percent. You know, um, faking it. Like take a gig. You're nervous. Well, if you haven't never done it. Take it anyway, fake it, learn how to fake it, and, and, and grow from that, you know? And, you know, it's hard. That's the hardest thing in the world, man, is to pitch yourself, and it always feels icky to me, you know? But I think, I mean, not necessarily in my case, but if, if, if you really work at your music, I don't know where you are. Where'd you go? Okay. Um, if you really work at your music, you know, and, and build up confidence through... The hard work and, and, like I said, being individual, and you, you'll realize that these people are going to want to hear your music, you know, and that's the bottom line, you know, like, like they were saying is that, you know, the hard work pays off and, and, it, and it empowers you to talk to these people, you know, because you know what you've done, right? All right. Let's give a big round of applause for everybody here. So... I'd like to say you all have taken a really good step. Seeking knowledge is the key to success in any business, right? And you guys have come here to listen from the leaders, the people who have done that. And I, I want to encourage you guys to continue to do that. That's why we created InterTalk Radio, so that we would be able to have these types of uh, notables and people in the industry to be able to to share back, to, to pay it forward so that we can grow this industry, so that we can raise these icons continually and to have a, a music business. And from there, I'd like to have Barbie close it out. Yes, I just want to thank the panelists, Andrea, Brendan, Miriam, John, Jorge, and Casey. And um, I also want to thank Musicians Institute, Mike Ramsey for putting this on, um, Make Music LA, Balance Breakfast, and the Alliance of Women Film Composers. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and weekend. Uh, there's some Intertalk cards up here if you want to get that to be able to hear this. Uh, we'll be broadcasting it by tomorrow. It'll be up on air, so the questions and everybody here will be on air. Thank you very much. <laughs>